great. Um, guys, so so welcome. I will, um, as as just uh, as just told, I will talk a bit about the replication crisis and um, open science measures that can address this replication crisis, especially pre-registration and registered uh, reports. Um, what will I do very uh, briefly? Uh, mainly it's an introduction on why does this all matter? How can we use um, registered reports and pre-registrations to um, address the replication crisis? And then we move into discussion and Q&A. Obviously, if you do have any questions in the meantime, where you feel it's good that we, that we ask and discuss this right now, feel free to, um, to talk about this during uh, the presentation. Before I start, because I think that's um, necessary, um, I obviously look at the replication crisis and the measures of pre-registration, registered reports, from my own perspective. So I'm really a micro guy in terms of really focus on social psychology, experimental psychology, organizational psychology. Um, so for some of your work, you know, whether you work qualitatively, whether you work more on uh, macroeconomics or other macro topics, it might be a bit different. I have some slides, some ideas for, for these um, other fields of research as well. Um, but obviously, if I say something, it might be a bit more from my own lens. Um, and then credit where credit is due. Many of these ideas, slides, the content come from many of my colleagues and collaborators, co-authors on many different projects. So these are all not my own. Um, in the spirit of open science, there is um, uh, an OSF link that you should all be able to access where I put uh, slides in there. I put um, all templates for pre-registration, for registered reports, different references for open science that I think are useful. Everything is in there. It should be freely accessible um, and feel free to use it, reuse it, um, and so forth. So this is a bit the um, uh, the itinerary. Um, what, what, what will be the goals that you know and understand what is actually pre-registration registered reports and how can they benefit um, to society, science, and also yourself? and that you understand what to include in pre-registration and registered report, and that you also understand where could you submit and how would you do a registered report. Um, just as a brief, and I know I'm preaching a bit to the choir here, but but what um, what is open science? And, and my, my friend and collaborator, George Banks, um, has defined that as open science refers to, uh, to an array of practices that promote openness, integrity, and reproducibility in research. Um, and I just want to ask the audience maybe for a second, what kind of open science measures, practices um, are you familiar with? Just just shoot. Anybody? Anyone? Okay, I mean, we... we, we, we oh. Oh, it's in the chat. OK, sorry, I don't see that. I'll, I'll just speak up and say um, sharing data, making your data freely available. Very good. Thank you so much. Yeah, sharing the data. OK, great. Absolutely, absolutely correct. Um, what else? I'll look into the chat. Yeah, data sharing. Somebody wrote in there. Any other open science practices or measures? Sharing yeah. your code for analyses. Yeah, very good. Sharing your code. I think there's somebody um, raising their hand, I think, or at least was. I we... want to say the same, so it's all, okay. it's all right. Yeah, sharing this okay. statistical course. Great. So actually, I mean, it could mean many different things, right? Um, some that you mentioned, sharing your data, sharing your code, sharing the materials. If you've done a survey or an experiment, what were the materials you used? Uh, open source, uploading a preprint, publishing open access. Um, there are many discussions also at our university on OER, so opening up educational resources like lectures and so forth, doing science, and some people say that's open science. I'm not doing science together with non-scientists. Uh, open peer review and open authorship practices, two things that I'm, uh, you know, that, that that are viewed more critically, especially in open peer review. I'm, I'm being honest, even though I'm the open science investor, I, I have my problems with like being complete transparent. Um, I'm a big fan of, of double blind review, but I mean, we can discuss that. And there's replication. And what I will focus on today are pre-registration and registered reports. Before I go into detail what these are, 
Um, let's go a bit back and, and, and ask ourselves, why do we need it? And one reason why we need it is, is this picture um, that, that many of you might be familiar with, right? So many journals look for significant results. And I want to tell you a bit of a short story about myself. Um, when I wrote my, my first paper, um, I submitted it to a very high-ranked journal in our field, um, an A or a plus journal, depending on, on what list you follow. And we, luckily, we got an R&R &R there. And reviewers had obviously many points, so I started looking into the data again. Um, and in that moment, I realized I made a mistake in the syntax. And I remember my hands shaking um, because the results were not super strong in terms of that it was, quote, it was significant but quite close. So I was really afraid that due to my error of the syntax, the results might move across this magical threshold of 0.05. And that would mean results are not significant anymore. That would probably mean um, the journal would probably not allow for the um, um, for the paper to proceed with publication. With, and, and so I was really afraid. I was lucky because I did a mistake, but actually the results were even better after I removed the mistake. Um, but back then, that was a crucial moment for me thinking, well, I have the same theory, I have the same hypothesis, the same methodology, the same robustness, and only because my results would look a bit different, that would mean my paper is not good enough all of a sudden. And I think that re led to realization together with a couple of, of talks I listened to and, and papers I read saying that there is a big problem. That that's not the way um, research should be done. Um, and, and why that is, is that on the one hand, I think we all agree as scientists that um, we, we hope we can contribute to something, right? And especially in the social and behavioral sciences that are often criticized, we also make the claim, hey, there's something useful we can do. Uh, you can use our research to combat COVID-19, for the climate crisis, for many relevant policies and so forth. Um, but what we see at the same time is that many people criticize scientists. And you know there are huge anti-science uh, movements in many countries across the world. People look very critical towards scientists, maybe more than ever, some say. Um, and we know that although scientists and also governments often say to follow the science, we know that science often is incorrect. Um, and I want to use a prominent example that maybe many of you are familiar with. Um, so the guy here, um, Dan Ariely, is, is was one of my academic heroes for a long time. Um, Dan Ariely is um, a researcher at Duke, a behavioral economist. Um, his TED Talks have been viewed many hundreds of millions of times, uh, many um, bestsellers he wrote. Um, and Dan Ariely um, had a research piece on that signing off on a, a document in the, on the top of the document, um, saying that everything you will say after this is truthful, that that actually increases honesty versus if you do that at the bottom, as many of you may know, in many documents, you write something and then in the end you say everything I said before was uh, truthful. That has been a very influential study published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences um, and has been actually used in, in policy, and I, as far as I know, in the UK, and, and, and hundreds of millions of, of taxpayer money has been invested to change documents, you know, to, to use that so that people sign off on the top saying everything that I write after this is truthful. So a couple of years later, um, a group of researchers, including Asher Willens from, from Harvard and a, and, and a couple of others, um, wanted to replicate that study. Um, and they did, and they published the replication also in PNAS, um, showing that this effect is not there. So in a, in, a, in a replication, a couple of replications, as far as I remember, they did not show the effect. They worked together with Dan Ariely, who combined the previous study with their studies. And so they published everything, and luckily the, the journal also required to upload all the data. And during that process, um, the, the homepage that I can really recommend, Data Colada, um, they looked at the data and they published a report saying that the data for Dan Ariely's original study, um, without a doubt, they say, right, with 100%, this data is faked. Somebody made up the data. And the way they found it was very clear. Somebody used even different fonts. Somebody just used the data that they had, copy-pasted it twice into a document, and just changed the signs so very, in a very 
easy, stupid manner to th so that it supports hypotheses. And so all the authors said, I didn't do it, um, I haven't touched the data, Dan Ariely did, uh, had the data. And so Dan Ariely said, no, yeah, I mean, I have the data, yes, but I work with a company, I obviously didn't fake the data, probably the company did, do, uh, did this. Why a company should this? Well, I mean, that's, um, we don't know, and the, and the webpage clearly says they cannot say certain that Dan Ariely did it, but somebody faked the data. And this is obviously a big problem. With this example, you will see that um, open science measures led to this discovery that this research is fake, but it also showed that apparently somebody engaged in very fraudulent and questionable practices um, to publish research, um, and that was used for policy, and that cost taxpayer money a um, huge pay, uh, amount of money. Why did somebody do this? Why did Dan Ariely or somebody else do this? And if you look at other examples, you might be familiar with the case of Diederik Stapel, um, who was a very prominent uh, Dutch psychologist who published in Science, in JPSP, in Psych Science, in all of these famous journals. And later on, it was uh, discovered, for those of you not familiar with the story, that he just faked the data. And he just faked, like even worse, so he just opened up an empty Excel sheet, uh, went into his garage, and just fabricated the data. There's this amazing story in his book where he like he bought M&Ms um, that apparently were for research participants, told everyone in the lab, hey, now I'm going to collect data, and that sh then he just went into his garage, um, ate all the M&Ms himself, and just wrote some data in the Excel sheet. Um, so as you see in a recent survey among um, Dutch researchers, um, they say that 8% of researchers um, have falsified or fabricated data. So what happened in the Stapel case, what happened in the Ariely case? And I think that's, to me personally, that's quite a high number. Uh, but what I think is way more problematic and what I will speak about more today is um, what you see below here. Namely, that nearly half of people engaged in questionable research practices. And what that is, I'll talk about in a second. Um, but one example here is if with Daryl Bam. Uh, Daryl Bam, very prominent Cornell uh, psychologist, also very uh, famous scientist. Um, he made a study um, that was very critical and that we sometimes we call the Big Bam, right? Um, that that led to the the replication crisis or the uh, replicability revolution in 2011. And so Daryl Bam, for those of you who don't know, made a study. Uh, was published in JPSP, one of the most prominent psychology journals, showing that across, I think it were seven to nine studies, um, that people have the ability to look into the future, right? They have a paranormal ability, and he showed experiments, so basically he asked participants what will happen next, which card will be opened up, and participants apparently knew this, and he said that you have this paranormal uh, skill that especially if it comes to sexual pictures, uh, people have kind of this, this paranormal skill. And I hope we can agree, um, and most people would agree, that this feeling the future, as Daryl Bem called it, is, is not a thing, that that's not physically possible. And the thing here is that Daryl Bem actually didn't fabricate the data, as far as we know. He didn't falsify the data. He didn't make up any data. Actually, he used what was common practice at that time. Um, does anybody have an idea what Daryl Bem did or could have done? Just, just speak up. To arrive at this data of something that I hope we agree is physically impossible. My guess is he analyzed the data in multiple ways and then chose the way that was consistent with the story he liked. Yeah, so he, he changed the data um, analytic approach. True, okay, thank you. Right, so he engaged in these questionable research practices. For example, he reported only a, a number of um, experiments and many others where it didn't work, he did not report. He excluded participants or included more depending on whether the results were in the way he, he liked them or not. And there were many things others. So the problem is that most research at that time was done this way. And that led to the conclusion that, okay, if there's somebody able to publish a paper using the methodology that most people do, showing that something impossible is supposedly truthful, um, we have a big problem. So as you all know, 
um, there's a publish or perish culture in academia that led to this. Um, we all, to secure tenure, to get a job, to um, get promoted, we need to publish. And we need to publish a lot, and ideally we need to publish a lot in these A or A-plus journals. And unfortunately, these journals mostly focus on results that are novel and that are statistically significant, which means at the same time, what? It means that results that are not significant um, or results that are, that are replicated or not replicated because they are not novel or because they are not significant, they will not pu be published. And that means researchers will conduct a study and if it's not significant or not something novel or sexy comes out of it, people will uh, delete that study and, and just it will be in the file drawer. And that means, you know, we only see the tip of the iceberg. We see the five or ten significant studies, but we might not see the 50 or 100 non-significant studies. And the problem here is, with all of this, we focus on outcome. Research is evaluated on what is the result rather than is it uh, on, on the methodological level robust. So this outcome focus reduces rigor. And to what that leads is the so-called replication crisis. Um, we see in a number of studies that, for example, many studies in neuroscience have a power problem. The N is too small. They cannot be replicated. Um, we see that in economics, which is actually nearly one of the best fields in that area, uh, still only 60% of studies can be replicated. Um, many of you might be familiar with the many labs projects where between 25 and 50% of studies could only be replicated. Um, and actually, there has been the cancer. So if you go to other fields than psychology or economics, um, there has been from the Center for Open Science, uh, the Cancer Biology Reproducibility Project, and where we saw that less than half of these cancer treatments could be replicated. And now we're talking about cancer in people's lives, right? I, I mean, I'm a psychologist. I feel psychology is very important. Some pi people might disagree. But I mean, with cancer research, I mean, we, we at least even there we should agree it should not be the case in less than half uh, of studies replicate. And we see a similar replication crisis in, in AI research that has a lot of implications. And John Ioannidis from Stanford even concludes that most, and that means more than half of studies, are false positives. So they show a significant effect, although in reality it's not there. Um, and how do people arrive at this? And please uh, note that uh, this is a how not to guide, not a how to guide. Um, what, what people use to arrive at these results, and some of you have mentioned that already, um, is you could hark, which is, I mean, you, you get results and then you change your theorizing, your hypothesis, saying, hey, all of my hypotheses were supported because this is my uh, theory. Um, and then results look counterintuitive and sexy, um, but actually you only hypothesize after you knew the results. Um, you could select to report only um, a specific amount of information. So maybe you had five studies, but in only two you found the effects, so only report those two. Um, you, maybe you find uh, support for three hypotheses, but not for the other two. Maybe you collect several dependent variables. You measure performance with quantity, with quality, with subjective performance, and then you report only the one dv for which you find a significant effect. Maybe you had several manipulations or conditions, and then you only show those where you see a significant uh, difference. There's uh, what Daryl Bam apparently did, optimal selective stopping, right? So you collect data from 40 people. Do you find the results? Yes, then you stop. Um, if not, you collect 50, 60, 70, in the hope that maybe at some point you get significant results, and then you stop. You can play around with control variables, include, exclude them. You can play with outliers, um, inclusion, exclusion criteria. We wanted to include people, you know, that are this age, this gender, their students, non-students, and so forth. Um, you can use different analytical methods. Somebody of you of, of this group mentioned that already. And then I think the last one for me personally, that's not a question of research practices, it's just cheating. It's just, you know, change the p-value just a bit to say, well, it's, I mean, it's slightly below 0.05, even though it was not. Um, so with all of these, you can get results to be significant. Um, and I'll, I'll show you an example. If you don't know this study, I can really recommend uh, reading it. So there's a prominent uh, psych science piece by, um, by Joe Simmons and colleagues. Um, and what, what they did is um, they 
played to people the song When I'm 64 by the Beatles, and they showed that people who listened to that song uh, became older, right? Were several years older um, than the other group who listened to Columba, um, right? And how did they do that? So they have really this nice piece showing the results. Everything looks as a regular psychology study. And then they have the second part of the paper where they actually show how did they arrive at this. Um, and the way they did it is they say, okay, actually, we had several dependent variables. We added 10 people more or less. We controlled for gender or interaction with gender. We dropped or didn't drop any of the conditions. And if you combine all of that, what you will see here is if you combine several of these things, the chance of arriving at a significant result beyond this magic threshold of 0.05 is already 61%. And if you look at marginally significant effects, uh, which sometimes are reported, even it's 82. I don't know about your fields, but at least in my field of organizational sciences, we have may, way more what's called researcher's degree of freedom. So our opportunities to do that than even here, right? In survey research, in, in publicly available archival data, you could use, um, you could have five different moderators, ten different dependent variables, many different mediators, right? You just put everything in the in the study, and basically, you can get a significant result with that in a hundred percent of cases. And the reason for that is our regular statistical methods using p-values and using regular coefficients are completely meaningless if you conduct several tests and if you don't. Um, you know, if you don't correct for alpha inflation, um, these tests are meaningless, right? If you just do 20 different tests, if you test in every other way, you are with nearly with 100% certainty to get a significant result. And if you then hark and say, okay, this is what I hypothesized all along, um, that produces research that re my colleague George Banks calls falls under the Chrysalis effect, right? At first, it's really ugly, but then you play around with it, right? And then it becomes really beautiful. Or some people say, you, you know, you, um, you work with the data until it confesses. You torture it until it confesses. So this is, um, this is one way to get your results significant. And I hope you guys agree that, i go back here a bit, um, that what we see here is really problematic. If we have cancer treatments that don't work, if we have psychological studies, if we have economic interventions for the poor, for the unemployed, um, if we have uh, studies that suggest this is how the, the brain works, this is how the mind works, if we have machine learning that apparently claims to detect cancer, to um, predict maybe employability, what else? If this does not replicate, if this does not hold, we should not be wondering that people distrust science, that people um, say scientists make this up. Right? There's been an interesting John Oliver episode on, on p-hacking and, and questionable research practice that I can recommend watching. But I hope we agree, if all this comes together, journals only publish significant results, researchers then engage in practices that make the results significant, although in reality these effects do not exist, um, we have a huge problem in science. Um, and that all sounds very negative. I know this is really problematic, um, but there is a way out, and that's what I'm here to talk about. And two of the most prominent uh, ways, and don't get me wrong, there are others, including replication, sharing your data, sharing your materials, which also led, for example, to the discovery of the Ariely case. There are many fields. In my personal view, and uh, there's also some data to back this up, the most relevant, the most prominent to to um, battle of the replication crisis are pre-registration and especially registered reports. So what are these two? And then I will go into a bit into detail. So pre-registration means um, that you get a time-stamped pre-specification that is mostly online of your design, your hypotheses, the sample size, exclusion criteria, what kind of analysis will you do, and all of that obviously before you collect data. Um, it's important to note that this is without peer review. Um, two prominent websites, and I'll show this later on, um, are aspredicted.org and uh, the OSF, the Open Science Framework. So basically, you answer a couple of questions and say, hey, this is how I will collect data. This is my, these are my hypotheses. This is from how many people I want to collect data. You say here it's um, you know the, the 20th of January, 
and then you collect data afterwards, and then you stick with that. Um, registered reports are um, go even one step further, I would say. Um, many of you know this approach actually from your thesis. Um, this is how science actually should be done, but mostly is not. Um, you develop an idea, you design a study, and then you say, okay, this is how I want to collect data from so and so many people. This is how I'm going to measure my um, variables, um, my focal variables. Um, this is how I'm going to analyze them and so forth. And then you send the paper out to a, a peer review. You receive feedback, you go through multiple, either you get rejected, you get invited back, you update your, your um, study based on feedback from uh, experts. And once they, they say it's, it's working out, then you only collect the data um, and then you write up the paper and it gets published. I will talk about a bit more of the details of registered reports um, later on, but I want to start with uh, pre-registration because I think it's the first step. It's really easy. Um, I now pre-register most of my work and it, it takes maybe like a half an hour, hour to do that. And it makes, there's a lot of research saying that pre-registration increases the quality, um, increases your citations, um, and it just makes for better research. Um, what do you include in a pre-registration? So in a pre-registration, normally you include uh, your hypotheses, uh, your independent and dependent variables, and how you word them or how you measure them, um, your sample, sample size, and this can be a bit broad, right? You can say from as many people as I can in the month of January, you can say uh, how many people I get with 5,000 euros or whatever, but you can also use obviously power analysis and be more specific saying at least 380, but in terms of dropouts from 460 or something. What is your design? What are all conditions? How will you handle outliers? On which basis will you include what kind of people? And what is your analytic plan? So are you going to conduct ANOVAs or a logistic regression? What are the moderators, mediators, and so forth? And the characteristics of a pre-registration is that it can often be um, on a page or less. On the OSF, it's a bit more. I'll show you two examples. And the, the nice thing is that on all those websites, you can create anonymous link that it's not linked to your name and you include it in the um, submission. So this is what I do, right? In my studies, I send um, this paper is pre-registered. Here's the link and people can click on it. They don't see my name, the reviewers, but they see that, you know, the way I write, wrote it in the paper is the way I before that said that I will do it. And it's really important. It's a plan. It's not a prison. And in my experience, I think in nearly 100% of the cases where I have a pre-registration, I have a footnote or a text saying in the paper, um, we deviated from the pre-registration in these ways or based on that reason. Right? So plans change, things go wrong, uh, you're becoming smarter that you should have done differently. It's important that you report how you planned it and how you're doing it and why and what do the results look like in both cases. Importantly, you can obviously not change your pre-registration afterwards. Um, it's um, obviously, but you should say how you changed it in the in the manuscript, and and most people actually do. So let me quickly, and I hope now this uh, works. Can I do a different share? I don't think so. But let me quickly see that I show you um, a bit of an example. Um, okay. Let see a good one here. Um, where is the, the share button? So I hope you guys can see this. Okay, right. So we have a study here. In that case, that's not the anonymized version because I'm in my account. Um, these are my co-authors. And in aspredict.org, it's now, um, I think now it's 10 questions, but they're very short, but before it was eight. So has there any been data collected? No. Normally, it should be yes, uh, it should be no, but if you say yes, then you have to explain a bit more. Uh, what's the main question? Say participants will follow unethical instructions more. Don't want to bore you with my research. Uh, what is the key dependent variable? How will you measure it, right? We had a formula in our case. What are the conditions? We have three conditions, low, high mind, and a neutral condition or control condition. Uh, what will be the analysis? We'll do ANOVA. Um, this will be the independent. This will be the dependent variable. Um, how will you treat outliers? We uh, vinzerized greater than one, less than zero, and we had exclusion criteria based on several attention checks. Um, and we said, hey, we will collect data from 500 people uh, until we have them, and then we'll 
drop out everybody who fails the attention check and then that will be our sample size. And we report all the other variables we measured and say, hey, we'll do some exploratory analysis. We will mainly do this and that. Right? This, this is what it, um, this is how one looks like. Um, I will continue to share my uh, presentation, but I can show you later examples. And in the um, OSF folder that I shared, um, I put other examples in there. If you're interested in some, I, I can I can also share. Um, more. So let me see that I share the right uh, screen with you guys. Um, a second, I hope that yeah okay. Um, I should be back on the on the slide. So the benefits of a pre-registration are um, you can distinguish to reviewers, but also yourself saying, hey, this is what my confirmatory research does, and this is what the exploratory is. And by the way, in nearly all studies that use pre-registration, there's a section on exploratory or non-pre-registered analysis. So you can definitely do that. You just have to be transparent saying, okay, this is what I anticipated before and this is what not. So people don't think or you don't think, well, you know, I, I plan differently, but now these results with a p-value of 0.01 are significant because in reality, maybe they were not. Um, it, it decreases your so-called researcher's degrees of freedom. You are more constricted to something, um, but it holds you accountable to yourself and others, right? Because one problem is we are all humans and there's hindsight bias and motivated reasoning. And you, I mean, if you are like me and, and most people, Maybe, you know, you twist it around, but later on you say, well, actually, I mean, it makes way more sense that the results look that way, you know, actually, this is how it should look like. But, you know, after the fact, it's very easy to convince yourself or others that this is the case. So it can really help you, um, and this is my experience, as soon as we start doing the pre-registration, then new questions come, oh, actually, we didn't really thought about how we will analyze the data we didn't thought about how to treat outliers and that really sharpens your, your um, idea and your paper. And um, it also helps obviously people to replicate studies. Um, not go too much into detail here, but what we can go through this if later is time. What are the difference between OSF and as predicted? Um, the main difference is the OSF is a bit longer um, as, as predicted. OSF is a bit more flexible. There are many different templates there you can also use a free uh, version where you just write your open text. Um, you don't in, in the as predicted, you don't need an account. So it's a bit easier. It's just these nine questions right now, nine or ten, I think. Um, it's less than a page. Um, in, in the OSF, you can connect more, right? You can um, put in data sets. You can pull all sorts of documents in there. In as predicted, you can't, but you can connect the research box where you can. So um, there are a couple of, of pros and cons. If you haven't done one, to be honestly, I would first start with as predicted. It's really easy, very straightforward. It's, it was what I just showed you, really eight, nine straightforward questions, um, and it takes not much time. If you have um, a study that is, say, maybe more qualitative, maybe qualitative and quantitative, maybe it's a systematic review or you combine several things, the OSF gives you more options to pre-register a study there. Um, and just to give you an outlook on pre-registration, um, my colleague um, Charlie Dorison, together with Jen Locke from, from Georgetown, they, they looked at some data and they said that their data suggests pre-registration will become the norm in the social and behavioral sciences. If you look at some journals in, in my field, more than 50% of, of um, uh, papers are pre-registered. In other journals, it looks, it looks way worse, but we have some really good journals that are now requiring it, and so it, it forces a bit of what Brian Nosek calls the pre-registration revolution. The numbers are going through the roof, um, and many more people across different fields and methodologies use it. Um, I put most of the templates in the um, OSF um, folder, but you can also Google them. There are templates for experiments, for surveys, for archival data, experiment, uh, experience sampling method, fMRI, qualitative, meta-analysis, and many, many more. Um, you might now think, well, is this for me? I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a social science person. Just, you know, as a reminder, and this is the 2010 studies, um, in many fields, results are significant, right? That goes for medicine, biology, immunology. So the, the publication bias is a big thing in most fields. And even if you're not from psychology or social behavioral sciences, um, 
it is very likely, as I gave my examples in cancer research, um, in in many in AI research, there are problems there, and there are things to change. Um, and in many fields, pre-registration, like in medicine, it's very common. Um, in other fields, less so. So my uh, advice to you is just do it. It's very low cost. It's for free. Um, it costs you a bit of time, but not much. It's really easy done. Um, my experience is once you pre-register, you normally don't go back. Always, if, if I could not pre-register a study for some reason, um, I always feel a bit bad and feel it's a bit fishy. Um, so my challenge to you is, you know, maybe pre-register one of your next three studies. Um, there are also good YouTube videos um, on how to do it, but it's really straightforward. I'll use the remaining two to five minutes, and I would like to move into the discussion to talk about one of my favorite topics, namely registered reports. Um, so registered reports, um, as I told you, um, this, this picture is a bit complex, but the, the idea is basically right up the front end of your paper. You send it for review. You might get rejected, but you might also get uh, invited for a resubmission. You revise it until either you get rejected or the journal says you get an IPA. And I don't mean the beer, but I don't mean the in-principle acceptance. And what that means is the journal commits to publish your paper irrespective of results as long as you do everything that you promised in the paper. And you might deviate from that, but you need to talk to the journal saying, hey, I need to change this and that. Um, there's much research saying that registered reports are of higher quality. Uh, they are cited not less, if not more, um, and many, many benefits. Obviously, they have way fewer significant results, right? This drops from in psychology from 96% to often uh, between 20 and 40% of significant results. Um, there are many journals where you can submit a registered report as of today already. Um, science, PNAS, Nature Human Behavior, Nature Communications, depending on your field, many, many psychology outlets, obviously, many, many in management where, where I am um, do most of my work, plus one, scientific reports, uh, American Political Science Review, and so forth, and so forth. There's a list uh, there. Um, I do have a paper currently with my colleague Fabiola Gerpa where we actually write a how-to guide, how should you write a registered report, and we also list the costs and benefits there and talk about different uh, journals. If you're interested in that paper, I can send you a preprint. What we did in that paper is we um, selected um, a base of best practices. What should you do? Uh, you know, focus on a research question that the result is interesting, whether you get significant results or not, right? Um, do a power analysis, um, upload everything, um, denote any changes from your initial plans, and so forth and so forth. We also maybe, and with that I would like to finish a bit, we investigated a number of common uh, what we call myths about registered reports. They will receive fewer citations. We don't find any support for that. And actually, there's a marginal tendency that they receive more citations, um, that they're less novel, that they're more risky, they're only suitable for experiments, all of that we don't find. We find registered reports across many different fields. They're being done by uh, PhD students mostly because some people say, well, maybe do that later on in your career where it's more safe. No, most registered reports are actually done in top journals um, by PhD students. Um, you, there's, it's, they're not less fun. Um, it's not like there's a power shift. You cannot do what you want more. The only two things for which we we don't feel there's um, it, there are myths, but they're not necessarily true. So there's mixed evidence there is that you might have to invest a bit more effort and more resources, but it's also unclear, right? Some people say yes, some people say no. Some results lean towards yes, some no. So there it's ambiguous. For all the others, there it's really clear that these are more myths um, than rather than have any, any truth to them. Um, and maybe last, uh, that's what we also looked at. There are more and more journals um, implementing registered reports, and there's more and more people talking about it. So it's really, again, it's a credibility revolution. It's a replicability revolution. Um, and I thank you that you might be interested in, in being part um, of that revolution. Um, I can also show you and guide you for as predicted or SF if, if you want to, um, but I really encourage you to do it. Um, I thank you very much for, um, for listening to me, and I'm very happy to answer any questions or anything I said. Thank you so much.